exploring contours of uh, privacy. We are having once again an elite panel among us uh, to discuss the same. I'd like to call upon uh, the panel. Uh, the moderator would be uh, Dr. Kamlesh Bajaj, who is the mentor professor at NIIT University and former CEO of uh, Data Security Council of India. The second panelist would be Ms. Mayurakshi Ray, who is the VP Solution Engineering Autism Networks. The third panelist is Mr. Subhash Subramanyam, who is the CISO IC ICI Bank. The fourth panelist is Mr. Advocate Sai Deepak, Associate Partner Sai Krishna and Associates. With this, I'd uh, like to leave the stage with Mr. Dr. Kamlesh Bajaj uh, to proceed with the. Question of who owns the data. 
and is my data collected, whether from the social media website or my surfing habits on any website and so on. So this collected by the private companies. At the same time, governments collecting my personal data through surveillance, big data surveillance and so on. So is it my data or does it belong to the company that is collecting it? And that is collecting it under the law or outside the law. So this data does raise this question of uh, who owns the data. So what is the kind of legal framework that is there or that should be there? In a country like India, I think we are still in the uh, nascent stage of the technology of uh, has been very high. And we are seeing that uh, I mean, this kind of thing is happening in a big way. So we are literally at the cusp of uh, a digital India revolution, smart cities, internet of things expanding. So which means that we are quite uh, and more and more vulnerable to such data collection and hence violation of privacy. So we don't have uh, the privacy law yet. So it's a green field in a way, although there is of course uh, section 43 here and some other clauses in the, uh, in the ITM. So we have to understand what kind of a privacy law uh, should evolve in that. Then we are seeing globally around the world, especially in Europe, that uh, they are trying to replace their data protection uh, directive by a regulation. So which means the regulation will be applicable to all the European members. Uh, they will not have to legislate, in the, uh, legislate the same in their own parliaments. So once the regulation is created, then uh, they will have to follow. So in the regulation, a lot of things are happening. And we will see how uh, this uh, discussion pans out. But the regulation has a uh, lot of expectations that individuals will have the right to be forgotten. So we'll see whether technology solutions are there uh, or not, whether the law can actually be uh, created in such a manner that it is actually impossible. <coughs> For example, user profiling. Can we build a single image of an individual given the so many databases? And we have the great possibility in our country with UID numbers uniquely identifying a single individual. So if the same UID number is built into all the apps in the country, all the government regulations uh, uh, insist on that, then profile of an individual can be created. So which is a very nightmarish situation in terms of absolute uh, <coughs> slavery of the individual, no privacy also. The individual himself is giving all his data on the uh, social website, not understanding as to what is ending up doing. And then, in the context of UN uh, uh, privacy resolution in the digital age, which came as a result of the NSA uh, surveillance, so there was a resolution passed, privacy in the digital age. So where they are talking about countries creating redressal mechanisms of uh, any privacy being violated, there should be a, a process clearly laid out which the citizens can take uh, recourse. So I think with this background, I would like uh, uh, the panelists to address uh, these three main concerns. So the first one on the economic value of information and what kind of privacy practices are there or should be there. I will have uh, uh, Subhash address that as a bank because banks and telecom companies are the ones who are collecting a lot of personal data other than the e-commerce websites, travel websites and so on. And then after that we will have uh, uh, Majurakshi talking about what kind of technical solutions uh, are emerging or should be there to protect the privacy of individuals. And finally, we will have uh, uh, Sai Deepak uh, talk about the kind of privacy laws which are emerging and uh, which should be there and maybe we should create those uh, in our own country. So with these words, I will have uh, Subhash start out the presentation. So each of the panelists will take uh, about five minutes and I will pose a specific question to them that open the floor for discussions. So you will have a chance to interact for about 10 minutes or so. Thank you, Mr. Vijaj. I think uh, that was very, very appropriately, the context was said very well by you. We are indeed in, uh, in the cusp of a very, very interesting time where on one hand you have uh, technology, a lot of trends in technology which are actually changing the way products and businesses are kind of reaching out to the customers, product delivery is changing, consumer experience is changing like it has never been before. But data collection, you know, mining of data, you know, for intelligence and everything 
is happening at a scale which was not even imagined say five years back from now. That, that's on one side. On the other side, uh, we are, you know, unfortunately today in a situation where security is much, much of a concern in every part of the world, whether one talks about Europe, whether one talks about Africa or the US or in Asia. The concern and overhang about security threats is probably in the last 15 or 20 years, it's probably at its peak. You know, I'm, I'm not even talking about the recent terror attacks in Paris. I'm talking about the whole sequence of events leading up to that, the Arab Spring and so on. So, in the context of this, historically, even in the best of times, it has always been an oscillating endurance in terms of security versus privacy. How much information does one need to be able to do what is required to be done, whether the context is an organization, a commercial organization, or whether the context is a nation state. The, the discussion has always oscillated in terms of whether it should be protection of individual privacy rights or whether the, the context is more about protection of the sovereignty and security of the state as a whole. Which one is paramount is something which has always swung at the best of times. In today's times, while privacy has emerged as a concern, there is a lot of movement which has happened. Different movements, let me put it, it's not one single movement. Put in place privacy laws and regulations. Often, to the shock of uh, many of the citizens of these countries who thought they were protected by privacy laws, they found that even the most fundamental privacy principles had been blatantly violated all along by nation states which had overarching regulations to have access to that data. So, without getting into specifics, that is the context in which we are in. Now, in terms of commercial organizations, which is a question Mr. Bajaj was to we are in a competitive environment, whether it is banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, or whether it is uh, new age econ companies which are trying to reach customers. There is a democratization, if one may put it that way, of the way markets are being addressed now. The you know overarching advantage which large enterprises had, let us say, 15, 20 years back, has really swung the other way because of democratization of information. Today, small enterprises, one can't think of a better example than let's say WhatsApp, a completely non-existent company which was non-existent say seven, eight years back, today is perhaps occupying the mind space of the entire you know, community which uses mobile phones and is probably the most widely used app across the world. For a company like this to come to the fore, you know, challenging established giants was perhaps unforeseeable a few years back. So, this democratization of the way the trends have been leveraged is at the expense of something, right? There is a lot of data mining which goes in by all these companies to be able to get their competitive advantage. In doing so, is there a violation of fundamental privacy rights which individuals enjoy? I would think the pendulum has been all along so far. Companies have harvested information, taken it to their advantage and I think the reasons for it are also obvious. When somebody sets up an enterprise or an established company tries to gain market share, I don't think privacy is on the top 10 priorities for the CEOs of those companies or the entrepreneurs who try to set up those startups. They are there to find a place in the market, they are there to deliver a product or a service and become a distinctive differentiator in the market. Privacy as a concept comes in at a much, much later stage when one gets confronted with regulations. So I think organizations, at least in this part of the world, were not so mature in terms of the prioritization that needed to be given to the fundamental rights of individuals with regard to privacy. There are well-established principles which are laid down. I think the founding uh, guidelines in this regard were laid down as old, as long back as say 40, 50 years back. OECD had laid down eight guiding principles for privacy. Uh, very obvious principles which have since largely got adopted with you know, some minor modifications by EU and it became a governing framework for EU for about 20 years, 1995 to about 2012, when it became formalized in the form of actual laws which became applicable for EU. So those seven guiding principles are pretty largely implemented in that part of the world. In Europe, the importance accorded to privacy by companies, the, the oversight on the fact that privacy principles are upheld is very strongly enforced in the legal framework there by the regulators there. 
when it is for violation of privacy or very stringent. So I would say maturity of privacy practices is very, very high in the apartment world. It, it would be interesting to see whether that really changes, at least in the context of the nation state, after the recent uh, you know, turn of events in, in terms of what happened in Paris and so on. But that's a different discussion. Uh, borrowing from there, I think there are sporadic efforts which have been made by companies in this part of the world to try and put basic frameworks in place. It would have helped if there was a comprehensive privacy bill or a privacy act which was passed in India and kind of uniformly made applicable to all the you know, commercial organizations as well as government organizations. Today we do have some uh, guiding laws for privacy, but they are not overarching. They are a part of uh, the IT Act. IT Act fairly clearly lays down certain principles which need to be upheld and what need to be done by organizations in respect of that. But I would say organizations are, have a long way to go before they really formally internalize those principles in letter and in spirit and, and uh, you know, uh, go towards protecting privacy rights. I'll hand it over to And you know, uh, moving or rather expanding from where Sumash left off. Uh, I'll tell uh, two facts that we, you know, all of us feel, and you'll see it in your day to day lives. So, uh, we had um, gone for a trip in the US, and uh, our photographs were there in our smartphones, right? The photographs were clicked in our smartphones. Now, all of us have some form of a Google account, right? About 10 days after we came back from that trip, Google sent us a link in which you know they kind of said that you know your US trip, uh, you know memento. What they had done, okay, is they just collated the photographs which they linked it through our Google account uh, because the photographs are always and time spent. They just put a sequence to it. They put up a story, right? That you know, they said that you know, you saw the Statue of Liberty and so and so, and then you made a visit to so and so, and you know, it is as if that you know, we had created it, and it was like you know, it was created completely by Google without any information or data provided by us. Such is the rich of social media, right? The second example, you uh, all of us having smartphones have access to the apps. Right? And the apps have become an integral part of our life. We need apps for booking a cab, we need apps for you know, ordering our food, we need apps for paying, uh, you know, uh, banking apps. And, you know, we, I mean, there are so many small and big apps. The moment you, know, you try to you know, go to a Play Store, whether you use Android or an iPhone, you go to a Play Store or the iPhone Store to, you know, to uh, download an app, you will see that every app asks for permissions, permissions to access your identity, your Wi-Fi data, your SMS details, your uh, address book, your contact details, so on and so forth, right? Most of us, because we really want the apps, or also maybe because of the fact, fact that we are maybe inadvertently or just, just you know, normally do not know that what the implication can be to give access to those data in our, those are our personal records, those are our private records. We just say yes and, you know, download those apps. What is the effect of those? That you know, those data. The moment the apps are saying that they are requiring permission to access those, every single of those data. Like if I make any change to my contacts, the SMSs that I'm receiving, even the IPs I'm using through which I'm connected to a Wi-Fi, every single thing is getting collected by the app company and maybe the parent company. They are getting stored in their server, right? So this is the extent at which you know we are as a consumer or as an uh, organization or as an enterprise, we are vulnerable to, to, you know, the, to, to intrusions of privacy, right? Article, uh, I think, you know, uh, 21 of the Constitution talks about fundamental rights and right to privacy is one of them, right? There is a, uh, you know, section 43 of the ID uh, Act of India. But if you know, uh, you know, each of them are prescriptive, we do not really have an act of privacy which is enforceable like the EU Data Protection Act. However, even with the EU Data Protection Act as well as the guidelines of C section 43, etc., right, there is one part whereby you know it, it, it says that the citizens have a right to privacy, but the right to the states 
goes supersedes that, right? Which means that the states do have a right to, you know, act, to, to intervene into the citizens' private data, maybe because of, you know, different reasons like, you know, to collect, to, to you know, uh, put that for, you know, our data collection or our or, or device that the UI really requires that, or maybe to, you know, uh, put that for, you know, some uh, security reasons, etc. But, you know, some recent events in the West, Okay, has shown us, and Subhash also touched upon that, that you know the state's right to that can actually you know uh, violate and potentially violate enterprise private data and as well as individual private data. And those are the things that no technology can prevent. In fact, you know, uh, if you see that in our open reports, I'm sure all of you have read, whereby you know uh, the US security agencies are asking for your gaps to technologies which otherwise prevent collection of data, right? They want, you know, uh, air gaps in security tokens. They want air gaps within encryption devices, right? So technologies are, uh, the technologies have been there, and but then, you know, one, those technologies have not really been, till now, focused on protecting privacy. They have been there to protect security. Right? There is a thin line between security and privacy and technology needs to you know, really evolve to protect privacy as a dedicated effort. Of course, you know, there are technologies which are emerging you know, to, to you know, even collect data or store data or transmit data by you know, considering privacy. So for example, you, know, you can you know, collect the data. And uh, you know, then, but then you know, after some point of time, you have to automatically erase the data. Privacy laws always talked about asking for permissions and defining clearly before you collect any private data. So those technology and framework definitions are there. It is just a question of enforcing them further. Okay, thanks very much. And we move on to for the uh, legal position. Particularly thankless task to keep the audience in case post lunch, so I'll try my best. Uh, I'm, I'm actually grateful to the other two speakers for touching up quite a few issues which I wanted to because it has actually exposed quite a few myths. One, there's no right to privacy. Two, the court has actually seized on this issue because this is one of the issues that the court has actually chosen to decide on in the Aadhaar conditions. It so happens that we are the ones who are representing the petitioners against the Aadhaar we also have an interview who were uh, part of the uh, Shreya Singh decision, where we represented the intermediaries. So this is to touch upon the aspect of intermediaries. Let's just clarify a couple of things and chat for a few minutes. One, there is no fundamental right to privacy as on gate. That's the position. Let's be very clear about it. Now, uh, Subhash, if I may address you so, uh, when the responsibility of private organizations, whereas man was basically talking of it from the point of view of an individual rights to privacy. Let's look at who are the prime movers and who are responsible for this entire Let's say who are the tremendous person in the first place. Right to property is no more a fundamental right. Right to free speech is a fundamental right. Right to religion is a fundamental right. Right to reputation is part of section Article 21 and therefore it's fundamental. Why is it that right to privacy is still not a fundamental right? Does anybody ask this question? So many aspects of individual identity have been treated as fundamental right by the Supreme Court in multiple decisions. But right to privacy continues to be debated. Why? There is a very good reason for this. This is a cultural and national attitude to privacy. Let's be very clear. If this was so fundamental and if we were particularly serious about privacy, then there would have been some kind of pressure on the government or the judiciary to take cognizance of this right and say, I'm sorry in this country we continue to treat right to privacy as a fundamental right. If that categorical observation has not fallen from the Supreme Court, that's because they represent the mood of the nation, they represent the culture of the nation, they represent the attitude of the nation. This is the fact. Now, who do you treat as a prime mover or who is supposed to take the responsibility for this? Two things. A private organization cannot be held responsible for violation of privacy as of date because first of all there is no fundamental right. And fundamental rights are asserted only with respect to the state. And you don't have a legislation which basically tells them what is the luxury for them. Second, private organizations are in the business of business. They are in the business of enterprise. 
they will follow law only to the extent that they are supposed to and not beyond that. Law for them is a common minimum denominator, not anything beyond that. They have no moral obligation according to them and that's how they are supposed to function according to them. So if we were to treat this as the living harsh reality of the circumstances in which we live in, then the obligation of ensuring that privacy continues to be a, or becomes a fundamental right in the future falls on the other two actors, society, civil society and the government. Civil society must put pressure and the government must actually act on the particular pressure. But the government also has a vested interest because it is equally interested in intruding into private space in the name of national security. And I'm not doing a list. I think it's a very legitimate reason, which is one of the reasons that most fundamental rights are subject to seven exceptions under Article 19. That's perfect. There's no problem with that. Neither is it me. The government has this thankless task of striking a balance between the ability of a private enterprise to encroach upon privacy to make profits and the right of a private individual to ensure that his privacy is not violated beyond the point. So this is something that the government has to do. But let's understand one thing. When you speak of privacy, this is not a subject that you can limit uh, the aspect of individual privacy. Because at the end of the day, what is it that you seek privacy over? Data that is related to you, personal identifiers and information that is connected to you. This expectation is equally legitimate on the part of corporations because an expectation which is legitimate from an individual point of view can be equally legitimate from a corporate point of view, which means data privacy. Now the thing about privacy, data privacy, so on and so forth is that the moment you recognize a right to a right, private information is fundamental and therefore that cannot be violated beyond a point of time. There are implications in other sectors which most people are not aware. So I don't know how many people are aware of this. This data protection controversy that's going on in the context of power speaking companies, where they're saying that the data that they produce in the course of uh, clinical trials and so on and so forth must be protected by the government. And this is the kind of expectation that's coming from the innovator companies, and this is one of the blocking points in the EU India free trade agreement that's going on, the discussion that's going on. It's installed because of this, because they're not able to agree. They're saying India is not a data safe country. You have no law, you don't recognize privacy, so on and so forth. So the moment you touch upon privacy, it opens a Pandora's box. And rightly so, and I think when you address privacy, you must address it comprehensively and not in peace. So, that's my take. I think we'll stop at that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sai Deepak. Yes, correct name. Yes. So there's only uh, nine minutes left, so I'll just give five questions which are my specifics for on uh, the economic value of information. And secondly, on technology, what is known as privacy and also technologies. And uh, thirdly, on the legal issues. Um, I'm happy to open the floor for specific questions. Yes, please identify yourself and then you can pose the question. Okay, hi. Uh... Can you use the microphone? Okay, uh, my name is Anubhav Bhatla and I represent SDG Corporation. Um, one question now, as we know that, uh, you know, the, the recent law change that's taken place uh, in EU and uh, uh, as you have just mentioned that, you know, India, we don't have any law, we don't have any controls right now. Uh, but the question really is in, in uh, you know, if you really look at the change that has taken place, it has given consumer the more power. Uh, you know, to have right on his or her own data. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, as you know, 28 countries have to abide by it by next early year, you know, starting early year, and uh, uh, not to do so uh, is 4% uh, as a, you know, penalty fee for the global sales. Uh, to that extent, the countries are thinking and the governments are thinking. Now, my question really is, uh, I don't, anyone can answer this, you know, uh, is that, in India, uh, today we all know that you know Google reads all our emails, and a perfect example given by uh, you know uh, Ma'am over there. Uh, who owns the data really? That's my question. Uh, in India, is it I? You know, so the status is quo. Am I as an individual responsible for my own set of data, or is there certain departments which are working towards that or they take up that accountability of being a data controller as well as being the data processor. So that's a little insight that I'm looking at uh, or where probably the government is thinking or uh, any action towards that front has been taken, you know. 
that's that's a question. Thanks. The question has two aspects. One, who owns the data? You have to ask this question in the context of one, the state, and second, private individuals. If it happens to be the state, then the legislation under which the data is sought and for whose purposes ostensibly it is sought will basically decide who owns the data. In nine out of ten circumstances, the government is the custodian of the data, not the owner of the data. That's one of the issues that's important. Second, as far as private entities and groups is concerned, the answer is straightforward. Read the PNCs. Most people don't read the user policy, the privacy policy, the terms and conditions. The ownership of the data is clearly defined then. How do you think that Twitter gets to use your photos that you put up on Twitter as part of its home page? If this is your data, how do they get to do this? Because clearly it's part of the terms and conditions. See, one of the things that we have to recognize is legislation can be private legislation as well. And private legislation and legal parlance is nothing but plain and simple parlance. So, one of the things that we must understand is, if we want contract to not have so much of power over our data, then we will need a legislation that says, notwithstanding anything contained in any contract, the right of an individual with respect to this data is privacy sacrosanct and can be used only to such and such extent. Therefore, you need a legislation. In the absence of which, questions of ownership have to be addressed by the contract which have entered into with private organizations. Anyone else? Yes. I see maybe something might evolve in that direction. 
and the lane for that may be taken by companies which have a large stake in doing business in these places. That's one way to do it. I think I'll supplement uh, uh, Shivangi based on my personal uh, experience also. The European position is different. Is they don't go by the kind of practices that we have bought for addressing the American customers. They want the laws to be exactly mirror image of what they have created. That is where the problem lies. The law has to declare this as a fundamental right and many such things have to be incorporated. The privacy law which the bill that we created under Justice English Act, which I happen to remember, even that is not acceptable to them. We talked about all the kind of uh, blue leaks and privacy principles to part of that and uh, exemptions in the manner in which the uh, EU directive or regulation has provided for them. But uh, they want exactly similar to what you are America had their way uh, simply because of the strength in terms of safe arguments, which of course now have been called into question by the uh, European Court of Justice. So even that is on the shaky grounds. But or will decide. I think it's, it's more uh, with respect to India and global data flows, which is our concern, is basically more on the legal issues, but <coughs> protecting our own sovereignty, our own sovereignty in the parliament. It's not any kind of governance issues. So it's a big challenge how we will solve it. And I have been part of the negotiations in the European Union from the industry side for four or five years. And I don't see anything really happening unless we can have a, a coercive pressure as a bargain the overall free trade agreement. So you would like to supplement this part? I completely agree with sir. Because uh, one thing is they want us to change our position completely on the aspect of data protection for pharmaceutical related issues. This has a serious bearing on our public interest in public health issues which we cannot compromise on. That's just one aspect. But let's consider the other aspect. Taking from what Zubarshad uh, just mentioned, and I think that's a very interesting point. You're absolutely right that the absence of a legal framework isn't uh, alone or something that we fall back on something next. Let's take one example. I'm sure most of us have read these news reports of a Hyderabad based clinical trial organization which was called up in uh, Europe because it touched clinical trial data. That was the allegation. And they were given two opportunities to rectify that and come clean on that, and yet they were not happy with it. And ultimately, that entity was practiced there. And the drugs which are the subject matter for clinical trials are ultimately banned from being imported into Europe. Now, in a situation such as this, India has law or it doesn't have law really doesn't make a difference because at the end of the day, you're catering to a customer who says, look, I want to comply with these things. If you don't comply with it, the product doesn't have my guarantee and all this. But no. There are some segments and there are certain markets which depend on the integrity of the information itself. So in the absence of a law, which I think is certainly bad because there is no certainty and you don't know what is the point that you cross where you end up becoming illegal or at least unlawful if not necessarily illegal because there is no law. You will try and comply to the best uh, 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 of your endeavors, to the best of your abilities. And in that process you perhaps even try and find out which is the legislation which according to me requires you to comply uh, with these restrictions in the most stringent manner possible and you take it upon yourself. But this too, again, you see, this is not an altruistic investment. This is a plain and simple business investment. Because you wish to get to that particular market, and therefore you wish to comply with something. But in markets and in segments where this is not exactly the requirement, what do you do then? Now, to take your point on this personal sensitive information, PSI and PI are the 2011 rules. Uh, Let me just put this here. I think for two months ago, I happened to write on this issue, and I'll, I'll tell you what are the problems with the definition. One, it does not apply to everything. Two, Admittedly, this is something that applies only on the east space, virtual space. What about the rest of the personal sensitive information? Where is the legislation for it? Today, internet happens to be a big thing and it is the most prominent interest in our face and therefore we are looking at it from an internet point of view. What about information which exists in the real world, in the physical world? Even that is protection. Where is the legislation for that? You go back to trade secrets, you go back to talks. You go to one court, you get a different decision, you go to another court, you get a different decision. There is so much of debate happening on whether or not India needs to trade secret legislation. Let's say I happen to work under Kamlesh sir as his employer. I take a couple of his hard earned and hard accumulated databases and I run away. And he has done his best to treat this as a trade secret during the course of my employment. My employment will be otherwise clear of that, all that is fine. He chooses to haul me up before a court of law. Let's say he goes before the Chennai High Court, Madras High Court, the Delhi High Court. You know what? Work against him despite merits being on his side. 
the fact that he is an employer or a former employer and an employee, and he'll be seen as a guy who's out to throttle competition. And people will not focus on the fact that otherwise I'm in the wrong. And there's a problem also. And this is a very common problem. Take a look at section 27 of the contract. That's about restraint of trade. You can't restrain trade or competition beyond the point. That provision is the bane of trade secret legislation because that is constantly used by every thief to basically say, this particular term of the contract of employment is nothing but a way of, of chopping, choking, and stifling competition. And this, this trade secret uh, 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 obligation which has been cast on me is a gar it's a different way of uh, imposing a, uh, an anti competitive restraint on me. That's how courts have been treating it. Which is why you need trade secret legislation, which is also another aspect of privacy, which basically says, notwithstanding anything contained in such provisions of the contract act, you'll continue to have protection for trade secrets. I'm just trying to very interesting discussion, but we are digressing going into a different direction. We've already run uh, uh, over on the time allotted to us, but if there's any other uh, question, two more questions I can take. Yes.
But doctor, at the end of the day, as a data subject, I am, you know, I am bound to use that technology which is available. Yeah, this is that's what I'm saying. Right. That's what and, I'm saying. And, and I that's think this is a period when the debate has started. So whether it is going to take 10 years or 2 years for this to happen, whether the global governments and the industry will agree, will it move in that direction, whether the lawmakers will actually understand this, as this phrase, who wants the data was by one of the senators in the US in the context of NSS surveillance when their companies were losing out of business around the world. So he started this debate, who is the data? And let us move the data to the user and say it belongs to them. So it is a debate which has started and will continue for my understanding uh, quite a long time before the NSS success. Sir, Dr. Bajaj, uh, on the question of accountability, uh, that, that is also a question of debate, right? And you know, this, this event we have uh, with, with my clients also. So for example, who is really accountable? Is it, the, is, is, is it the enterprise who developed the app? Who is providing the app? Is it the telecom service provider who is the carrier? Right? Or is it the custodian? Maybe you know, the data ultimately goes and gets stored in a central you know, uh, custodian. So who is accountable? And that also brings into the point that Dr. Vijay says that ultimately you need to have a very, very strong regulatory and legislative support to you know, enforce into, into these things to define clearly the ownership and accountability of the of, um, I think with this, uh, we will uh, close the discussion. And any further questions that you have, uh, the panelists are available uh, during the team. So with these very interesting